start. Okay, hello everybody and good afternoon and welcome to this session called the Transformation of Finance. It promises to be in a very interesting discussion. In fact, so interesting that there's almost a riot outside the door right now <laughs> of people queuing up to listen to the bankers, which is great, great start. But we are indeed at a very, very interesting moment in finance. I've been coming to Davos since 2007, and I think there have been three phases in terms of the Davos debate about finance. Back in 2007, the first time I came, bankers were on top of the world. <coughs> um, everyone was in love with credit derivatives, financial innovation was celebrated, bankers threw great parties and held their heads high, and it was certainly a time when finance was booming. Then, of course, we had the crash, and for the past few years, most of the panels at Davos have been dominated by endless discussions about regulation, what went wrong, essentially bankers saying sorry or not saying sorry, and lots of discussion about what could be done in the future to make things safer. A very backward-looking, very inward-looking debate. What's interesting about this year's agenda in Davos, if you haven't poured to the program yet, is that there is barely a discussion about regulation at all. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about those wretched acronyms anymore. Instead, it's a much more forward-looking discussion about fintech, about the big changes that are sweeping through finance and potentially transforming finance in ways that are both positive and negative. Now, as someone who's a journalist and paid to be cynical, um, my day job is I oversee the Financial Times in North America. There's part of me that thinks, well, maybe this is just a new way to distract people from some of the underlying problems that still haven't been solved in the core of banking. Certainly, if you talk to bankers, their intros are still bulging with regulatory issues. Or you can say, actually, this is the real story. <laughs> and while we've all been worrying about the backward-looking crisis in the last two years, we've been fighting the last war. In fact, the biggest challenge to incumbent bankers today is not the crisis and regulation, but the new players. Or you could say, actually, this is going to be what revitalizes banking and allows the bankers to suddenly become beloved by everybody and maybe, just maybe, makes the bankers suddenly very fond of the regulators because guess what? Maybe they're going to protect them from the new disruptive forces. Lots of change, lots of very interesting issues. And we have a terrific panel here to discuss it. We have three incumbent financial, two incumbent bankers, one incumbent um, insurance sector representative. At the very end, known to most of you as Tom Deswan, who runs Zurich Insurance Group. Um, we have in the middle, you can see um, John Cryan from Deutsche Bank, Code CEO. And next to me, in my immediate left, your right, is James Gorman from Morgan Stanley. But we also have an incumbent, or a semi-incumbent, um, who may is, well, I don't know how, sorry, 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 disruptor, not incumbent, a disruptor, <laughs> semi-disruptor. So I'm glad you didn't flounce off the panel in a fit of, <laughs> 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 yes, well, compared to some of the real startups, you, they may think of you as incumbent right. now. But anyway, um, a disruptor, Don Sh Dan Shulman from PayPal. And of course, we have Christine Lagarde, who runs the IMF, who takes an overview of what's going on. So I'd like to start with a quick overview from Madame Lagarde. Um, the IMF has spent a lot of time in the last few years looking at the financial crisis and what's wrong with banking. But today, you have something slightly different to unveil, don't you? Because the IMF has taken a slightly different role, a slightly different direction in terms of looking at finance. Can you tell us a bit about that? And tell us briefly where you see finance going in the next few years. Ooh. Thank you, Gillian, for setting the, uh, the agenda and, and a tough question. First of all, I think that uh, your point about regulations is well taken, yet uh, the, the entire regulatory environment is not completely settled yet, and there is still work to be done uh, in, in various areas. I think the, the, the cross-border resolution is one of them, uh, which has not yet been completely settled. And I think uh, there are issues to be resolved between the US and Europe in terms of uh, over-the-counter derivatives and, and uh, clearing systems, which are not really exchanging information at the stage, at the level and in, in, uh, at the speed where they should. So in those two areas, at least more regulation uh, is, is still to be defined and agreed upon. Two points. Um, there are new ways of doing the regular traditional business. And for those of us who have uh, kids or young adults uh, in the family, uh, 
you know that they don't go to a bank. They don't go to, they probably many of them have not stepped into the branch of any particular bank, yet they do banking. But they do it in a different way, using different channels, using different uh, modus operandi, uh, which has nothing to do with interfacing with a person or with an account manager. And that's for the sort of retail basic uh, banking, which is certainly disrupting the business of many traditional institutions, including some uh, possibly in the room. There is a, a second point that I wanted to make, which is one where we have uh, done a little bit of homework, and I'm saying on purpose a little bit of homework because it's the beginning of a process. And that touches on virtual currencies and the ways in which uh, blockchains, uh, blockchains technology uh, ledgers can actually disrupt the, the business in a much deeper way than another way of doing the same business. Uh, and frankly, I'm saying that this is the beginning because we know relatively little about the virtual currencies. Uh, what we know is that they're not yet a major component. Uh, I want to give you the numbers because I think they matter. Uh, the current total market value of uh, virtual currencies is about 7 billion US dollars at the moment. And if you compare that with US currencies in circulations, I mean, you know, banknotes, coins, it's about 1.4 trillion dollars. And if you include US money supply, otherwise known as M2, you are talking about $12 trillion. So what we are talking about, these VCs, is really a very small compartment of the total currencies around the world and the total uh, creation of money using different means. So it's still a small component, small item, maybe nothing to worry about. But just like so many things, you know, it's a bit like the, the tale of two cities. It was the best of time, it was the worst of times. Well, virtual currencies, you could argue, is extremely beneficial beneficial for the customers, uh, it brings better value, it reduces costs, it provides financial inclusion, it provides versatility, it reaches out to places where people were not bankable uh, in, in uh, some very far and remote places where technology is beginning to make huge entries. That's the best of time. Worst of time, it's a great instrument for crime because a lot of it has nothing to do with central control, with the central banks, with supervision, with regulatory environment, and it's a very nice way, and people who look into how terrorism is financed will tell you a lot more than I would, but I've heard them, uh, but it's certainly a, a potential instrument for illicit transactions, for money laundering, right. for terrorist financing. Equally, if it was to develop significantly, it would be also a potential threat to financial stability because it's completely outside uh, the, 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 the realm of uh, regulator, right. regulated uh, activity, and there are some tail risk scenario that you could actually think of. Third, and we don't see that as a risk going forward for the moment, it could disrupt monetary policy. Too small to really right. uh, be, a, be, be a concern at the moment. Our bottom line, uh, and that's very preliminary because we believe that this scene is going to change massively going forward, but bottom line, just as we heard in 2008, the investment bankers who were just coming into the net of supervision and regulation didn't like it very much but had to resort to it, saying to all of us, please look at the funds and see what the hedge funds are doing and why they shouldn't be included in the net. It might very well be the case that going forward, a lot of those that are regulated and supervised by virtue of what is defined as the banking activity, whatever form it takes, retail investment or more innovative, might very well say, please include them as well, and this go beyond the shadow banking, uh, which is you know, a bit more into, into the, the net of regulators and supervisors. You've asked me to be short, so I'll right. stop here. Okay, well, thank you. Well, for those of you who'd like to read the entire report, I'm sure the IMF has got plenty of copies to hand out. And um, it's available on the net as well. Exactly. <laughs> or you can download it on your cell phones <laughs> right now. Um, but so from Basel III to, to the blockchain, that's quite a big thing to span. Yep. But I'm curious, um, James and John, when you look at your inbox about what you are actually dealing with day in, day out, in running big banks today. Do you care about any of this electronic stuff, virtual currencies, or are you still fighting the last war and dealing with the regulatory onslaught from the last, um, last crisis? And what do you think are going to be the big forces shaping finance going forward? James, would you like to go first? Because you're nearest to me. I can jump on you easiest. Thank you, Gillian. Um, 
yeah, we care a lot. Um, we're in an industry that is driven by technology. And whether it was the advent of the ATM machine or the advent of the credit card or any of the evolutions and innovations of the last 50 years in finance, it's, it's part and parcel of what we do. In fact, we, we had our earnings call yesterday. Uh, we focused a lot on what we're doing with our core businesses. Uh, the first email I got from one of our board of directors was about an article relating to FinTech in the paper that day. And, and it was a healthy reminder that while we're talking to investors about what is in front of us, we have to have enough of a share of our mind looking forward to what might challenge us in the future or what might be opportunities. But, you know, if you, if you go back to the simple inbox, um, I'd love to say that the banking sector is kind of done with regulation. We, we know what the regulatory world looks like. We have a fully integrated global regulatory system, as uh, Madame Lagarde just said, we clearly don't. Um, that all of the rule changes that have been put in place over the last several years have finished. And, and I don't think anybody could say that that's actually the case. So in terms of inbox, we spend a lot of time worrying about regulation. The GCIP buffer, as an example, for the, for the uh, globally systemically important banks is a major new step that's coming down the track. TLAC, one of those acronyms that we're trying to avoid, has been something all of the banks have been adjusting to. So if you're, if you're not focused on how the regulatory environment can shape the kinds of businesses that you're in and dictate the kinds of returns you can expect from them, you're not doing your job. At the same time, if you're not sh uh, focused on um, how some of these innovations are disrupting different parts of the financial system and how you can embrace them and use them to win business, not just defensively, then you're not doing your job. In our space, I mean, I think in sort of the world of disruption, we've got um, obviously Dan from the payment sector, um, there's the credit sector, and then there's the investment sector. We'll come back to this, I'm sure, in the discussion, but I think there are very distinct challenges for each of those sectors, and at very different stages of maturation, and that's largely driven by what the economic proposition is to the client by going entirely digital through payments, through credit, or through wealth management. Right. John, how do you see it? I mean, when you look forward, say, five years, mm -hmm. how do you think the banking sector will look? Do you think you'll have a different set of rivals? Um, <clears throat> well, I think we've always had to cope with, with new entrants into the various aspects of finance, which we as a bank at least prosecute. We have essentially three businesses. We have a traditional banking business where we take deposits. It's it's the reason why banks are regulated, is the taking of deposits, and people sometimes forget that. Um, we then have a stockbroking business, um, which, uh, which has borne the brunt of much of the regulation, um, oddly because the source of the crisis was actually just the extension of poor credit. And then we have a fiduciary <coughs> business, which um, so far has been um, the business that has benefited interestingly, from most of the legislation and rules that have been introduced since the financial crisis, they've, uh, they've generally benefited fund, funds under management and fund managers, which is an unusual um, beneficiary when you think about what went wrong. Um, in banking, there is clearly um, some risk that we would be disintermediated or made irrelevant because we've been slow to move in technology terms. There is a degree, though, to which we are still protected by, for example, clearing rules. Um, although PayPal can move a lot of money around, ultimately clearing, particularly in US dollars, is tightly controlled. And very often the payments are made from one bank to another bank um, by means of something other than a bank. Um, so the bank's still involved. I think on the stockbroking side, um, we're really just trading electrons anyway. Um, everything's been dematerialized. and. Um, I think we cope with that relatively well. On the question of whether cash will exist in future, uh, I think we, we do actually spend quite a bit of time on that. Mm. And whether, because cash, I think, in 10 years' time probably won't. Um, there's no need for it. It's terribly inefficient and expensive. But it, if you think about money, and there's a, there is actually a lexicon today, so I'm not, but I'm not plagiarizing it. If you think, uh, there are really three functions right, feel, of feel cash. Feel free to read out the FT to the audience. There are three functions of cash. And if you look at the blockchain, te blockchain technology itself is quite interesting. Bitcoin I don't think is. 
Blockchain, I'm much more interested in, we'll come later, I'm, I'm much more interested in data than I am in process. I think where we're really struggling is with data. And the rules around data and the new regulations on data and the obligations on banks to report on data, m much more so than process. But if you look at blockchain technology, I think it can be used for digital identity purposes, mm -hmm. if that's acceptable to the G20, because that's going to mean, this is going to be a supranational initiative and the US is going to take, have to take a leading role in this. But if we look at money, it's used as a medium of exchange, but we barter in, in lots of things that aren't money at the moment, um, including Bitcoin. Uh, it's just another medium of barter. Right. Uh, it's a bit opaque, so it's used for buying pornography and, and potentially for illicit, other illicit purposes. Um, it hasn't gained too much traction. It's a bit complicated, so I think people will be put off by that complication. Money's used as a store of value, and Bitcoin hasn't proven to be a very good one. I think it's gone from about $200 a Bitcoin to, yeah. two, to a, 300 to 1,000 or something. And it hasn't been reliable at the moment. It's not very liquid. There are only 21 million of them, so you divide them up into very, very small chunks if you need to use them. So as a store of value, it hasn't been terribly reliable. And there are better stores of value. There are better stores of value sometimes than cash. Yes. Um, and it's interesting whether, um, you know, if the oil, if oil price has fallen, has the dollar just gone up or has oil fallen? Yeah. Um, and everything's relative. The other measure, um, the, the, the other aspect of cash that's important is, is a unit of measure. Mm. And we account in cash terms. We, 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 yeah. we, we express our accounts in dollars or euros or how we, we account. And I don't think there's much threat there um, because it's just convenient, it's decimal, it's easy to, right. easy to use. But we do worry about cash because I think that should be dematerialized. I think right. the world has enough robust technology. Right. And I think um, governments would be interested in that because, I mean, it's the old adage that the, the, the money launderer's greatest friend is the 500 right. euro note because it's, it's anonymous and it's right. a relatively large denomination. It'd be better if everything were traceable. So can I just jump in there quickly and say, I mean, it's either Morgan Stanley or Deutsche Bank. Are you developing a blockchain technology right now? Well, the technology is developed. It's the use of that technology. And we it? wouldn't presume to do it ourselves. So we're working with lots of other companies. Um, and we're planning on useful ways of using it. Mm. And one of the issues I have is it's, it's, people are too prone to get excited by a technology rather than its useful application. And we have to be practical. We're never going to develop technologies of that nature. They're, thorough, they're very complicated. But there could be uses way beyond Bitcoin because they're quite, uh, they, 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 they essentially are a protected, unique identifier. Right. And James, that could be useful. James, are you about to launch a blockchain function in Morgan Stanley? I'm going to ask Tom that as well. No. Um, but <laughs> uh, others are. And we'll access the technology. We partner with a lot of people. I've, you know, I'm, I'm more focused, honestly, on things that take away human interaction. Our business is built around, we're a service business, we're built around people, people <coughs> making uh, intelligent decisions, guiding clients, whether it's allocating assets, whether it's trading in different currencies, and, and what, what parts of our business model are susceptible to being disintermediated in that way. And whether it's through robo-advice, can you build an expert advice model for all people or only for people with very simple portfolios? Um, whether it's through electronic trading, do you really need traders sitting on desks and to what extent do you need them? Uh, whether it's through uh, developing expert systems to model M&A transactions and due diligence on those. There are lots of ways where we have historically added value. We obviously believe we'll continue to add value in those. But where are the pieces that we can adopt, embrace technology that give our clients more certainty with what they're doing. So we're, at, we're adding value at the higher end, the true advisory end of the spectrum. So that, you know, th this is a, and by the way, there's sort of a, a little bit of, I think, near hysteria about FinTech. It, it's real, it's here, it's, it's disruptive, but it's not gonna change everybody's life tomorrow. You know, th this is gonna unfold over many, many years in, in different ways. So as, as large corporations, you can't, nobody's got the wisdom to see how Every product is going to unfold perfectly. So you have to make bets. You have to form partnerships. You have to have alliances. You have to uh, hire talent who come from outside of the banking system. A lot of things that we're doing is basically building optionality. Right, right. Just out of curiosity, before we come to Tom, looking at 
you in the audience. Um, how many of you in the audience um, use online banking? So almost everybody <laughs> does. Um, how many of you have ever used a robo-advisor? Okay, three of you, four of you. Um, interesting. Mm -hmm. And how many of you have faith that blockchain is a viable product or, or process that will actually form part of financing in the next, say, four or five years? Someone's got put two hands up. They're such an enthusiast. Probably the CEO from blockchain. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Well, okay, well, that, I must say, okay, bad news. That's only about a third. The other, other, other two thirds of the audience are looking a bit suspicious about this. But um, anyway, Tom. How is this playing out in insurance? Because, I mean, I can't imagine you're about to jump on the blockchain no, bandwagon, no, are you? No, 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 no. But I, um, let, let me start by saying that we, the insurance industry, especially in Europe, is just gaining um, some breath after the introduction of Solvency II. So when we talk about regulatory impact on the way uh, we, uh, we do business, it has been phenomenal. And uh, some, some of my, my, my colleagues are still trying to uh, stand up after the, implement, uh, um, the implementation of Solvency II. Um, as far as uh, fintech is concerned, I think I think McKinsey report showed that the insurance industry will be the most affected, one of the most affected parts of the uh, of the economy as far as uh, uh, f uh, um, uh, technology and financial services industry is concerned. And and one of the main reasons being obviously that um, the risk pools are being affected. Um, the possibility possibility to use big data to uh, make risk more granular, uh, granular is 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 enormous, and and um, you can even have a, a debate on the basis of insurance, which is based on solidarity that somebody wants to insure some, something that might happen. And if he knows that it's going to happen, we don't want to insure it anymore, and he won't take out insurance unless it actually the, the house is on fire. So that that is a major fundamental discussion that takes place in the insurance industry. The only problem is. And I think that is a point that was made by uh, uh, John as well, is, is, is the timing of, of, of the thing. I mean, we know that, that cars become more intelligent. And we know that um, uh, accidents uh, uh, um, uh, will decrease tremendously when we all have sensors in our cars that avoid uh, uh, head-on collisions. Unfortunately, at this point of time, given the level of oil, oil prices, people um, have more cars, use more cars, drive more, and we have more accidents. So it's, it's very difficult in a present uh, environment to, and you have a, can, can have a theoretical debate about risk pools, you can have a, th have a, th a theoretical debate about the solidarity element in insurance, but the day-to-day -day management of the company is, to put it bluntly, much and much more important. So I think I think that you have to I mean, I mean, life on the top of a financial institution was not easy, is not easy, and will not become easier because this unpredictability of how fast technology will influence our work is very difficult. You know that it's coming. On the other hand, we still have to manage to come the, the, the business we have at this point of time. So you have to, to find the right, right balance. You have to find... Um, Alliances with disruptors. I, I'm, I'm a firm, firm believer that disruptors need us, the incumbents. I have not spoken to one disruptor who actually wants to take insurance risk on his balance sheet. He wants to sell the products. He wants to sell us products, but he doesn't want to take the insurance risk on the balance sheet. And in that respect, I think that the incumbents, <coughs> at least the insurance side of the incumbents, have a strong um, uh, argument to... Um, create alliances with disruptors, take them in, and um, use them, and they use us, to the benefit of both, in order to create new products, um, create new distribution systems, and hence enhance the value of both the disruptor and the incumbent. Right. Well, thank you. Well, Dan, as somebody who is the non-incumbent on the panel... <laughs> um, I mean, when you hear the incumbents saying that they think the disruptors are dying to do alliances with them and they need the incumbents, and I mean, when you hear this talk about, you know, the incumbents embracing technology and things, <clears throat> do you think that this is simply a case of the incumbents becoming, you know, a bit savvier, a bit sexier with their electronic stuff? Or do you think actually what we're going to see is disruptors, outsiders come into finance 
and change it in a much more radical way in the years ahead? No, I don't think it's either or. And I think partnerships are going to be important for everybody. But I will say when I was at American Express, um, what I used to say all the time is that the biggest impediment to our future success was our past success. And I really think a lot of big companies extrapolate from what was and don't sort of reimagine what could be. And they, and that's a, a danger for a lot of uh, big companies. I think there are five key trends in my view that are going on right now that uh, I think we all need to keep in mind. First of all, money is absolutely digitizing uh, in front of us right now. Uh, checks are disappearing. Cash we talked about um, all over the world, money is digitizing. However, let's not forget, 85% of the world's transactions are still in cash right now. So we've got a long way to go on that, but it is just inexorable. It is going to happen. Money is digitizing and will continue to do so going forward. Second thing is mobile uh, is exploding across the world right now. And it's not just mobile. Everyone knows that. Uh, but the bill of materials for a uh, smartphone is now under $30. So everybody is going to have a smartphone. It's as simple as that. When you have a smartphone, you've got all the power of a bank branch in the palm of your hand. And to me, this combination of money digitizing and the explosion of smartphones enables us to think about basic consumer transactions in a fundamentally different way. Imagine thinking about banking and, and starting it in a world of software and mobile. It would be fundamentally different for basic consumer financial services, not for mortgages or some of the other wealth management, but for that. And I believe that affords an opportunity to bring in the billions of people across the world that are outside the system right now. And that is a thing that we're very focused on. Third. The amount of data is exploding everywhere. Um, and it's not going to stop. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, people are like, well, let's hold it back. You know, we're worried about it. It's exploding. And algorithms are sort of the weapon of the digital company. And if they're the weapon, then the ammunition is data. And the more data you have and the better quality, the better you can create value propositions that allow you to target various segments of the market and serve them in better ways. Of course, there's the flip side. You've got security and privacy issues that you need to think about. You've got discrimination that you have to worry about. But data is exploding, and it is going to fundamentally change value propositions out there in lending, uh, in uh, numerous uh, um, areas. Fourth thing, industry lines are blurring right now, and product lines are blurring. So you have got circling around digital payments right now You've got technology companies, whether it be Google or Facebook or Amazon, um, Microsoft. So you've got tech companies. You've got carriers, mobile carriers, circling around it. You've got OEMs, right, uh, handset manufacturers. You have merchants circling around it because merchants fundamentally see mobile and digital payments as a, a redefinition of commerce, right? How do they create new value propositions to use mobile and software to get closer to their customers? That's going to happen, and we're not going to get in the way of it, and it's already starting. And so how do we create platforms uh, and API sets and software to enable merchants to get closer to their consumers? And then finally, the fifth trend is security, uh, something I think about uh, literally every single day. We have a tremendous amount of data and information. Authentication uh, is very, very tough these days. I mean, everybody's password has been compromised. That, that is the truth of the matter. So it isn't you know, protecting somebody from logging in. They're going to log in with real identification uh, into account, real ones. It's yours, Julian. We know exactly which ones. It, you have, we know what your username is, we know your password, we know stuff about you, and the bad guys have it. So you got to have a huge amount of data, and I think scale really matters here, because what you have to do is take that data and information, create walls as best you can, but then make sure you have information and data that spots abnormal behavior and prevents it from leaving uh, right. the system. And so I think 
those five things are, are happening and fintech is in the middle of that. But you know, this is going to be a combination of regulators, incumbents, new people pushing in uh, to this market. And I think it will fundamentally redefine basic financial services more in the next five years than it's occurred in the last 30. Wow. Well, that puts the 2008 crisis in perspective. Um, can I quickly ask, I mean, how many people in the room agree with John's prediction that cash will no longer exist in 10 years' time? Okay. That's a pretty striking, pretty striking statement, given that 85% of the world's transactions yeah, are done in cash no right way. now. But not in, vol uh, in volume, huh? in number. It's 85% yes. in number, in not in volume. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. That's right. Other yeah. I mean, there's a yeah. big difference between yeah. the two. Yeah. And while I'm on that question, how many of you think that the current big lineup of big name banks, some of which are represented on the panel, will continue to dominate banking in the next 10 years, in 10 years' time? Do you think we'll still have the same big name banks dominating banking? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> one. Okay, one person has stuck his neck out and said the future belongs to the big name banks. Um, oh, it's a quite, I guess the, the key question I wonder about this is to what degree are the regulators prepared for this? Because it strikes me right now is that ju I, know, I firmly believe the 2008 um, crisis was partly caused by tremendous levels of fragmentation in the regulatory community and central banking world, which prevented them from seeing what was going on. But once again, we have a lot of fragmentation. We have people looking at tech in one regulatory department and people looking at finance at another. Who wants to jump in on the regulators? Tom. Well, I, th okay. I think that the regulators first have to question what, what, what are we going to regulate before they actually start regulating. I, I think uh, um, Dan was, was referring to the incredible amount of data that is being generated. Um, and that the financial industry will use to um, service their customers, develop products, uh, analyze the, the risk perspective of their customers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the, the biggest issue there is that the financial world is still rebuilding trust. We're not, we're not there rebuilding trust. And the question is, how can we, while we're rebuilding trust, also convince our customers that we should be allowed to use their data in order to service them better and create, uh, create new, new products? And I think one of the, the, the problems from, from the regulatory side, but I'm, I'm not a, I used to be a regulator, I'm not a regulator anymore, is that, that they have to define what they are going to regulate. Uh, are they going to re regulate uh, privacy further? Or are they going to regulate the transfer of da data across borders? Uh, and, and how do you then um, see to that you have a regulatory environment that is global, globally apl applicable? Otherwise, you can't use it at all. Right. So I think that is a much bigger problem that before you start regulating, that you have to know what you regulate. Dan, and then yeah. I know John's got something you want to say on this yeah. as well. But Dan, Dan first, then. Yeah. So I'd start off by saying I think that most of us uh, in this panel would agree that in general what regulators want and what we want is very, very similar. We want protection for consumers. We want it to be a transparent type of system. We want security uh, for that. I, I don't think anybody can argue with that. It's hard to argue with it. You could, but you'd be kicked out of the system immediately. Um, but I think the issue really is um, what are we trying to regulate and how are we trying to go do that? For instance, again, when I was at Amex and we were doing stress testing, you know, and we were stress testing, what if the housing market collapses as much and what would happen, et cetera? And I'm like, you know what? Honestly, that's not the next stress that's going to happen. The big next stress is the financial system is going to be hacked for one or two days and there's going to be a pandemonium that's going to happen and that's going to be the stress. Thing that's going to—it's not what happened; it is probably what is likely to happen going forward. And that wasn't part of the stress test, for instance. I think it's a big oversight because I think, uh, you know, not to be pessimistic, I think it's likely that something like that could happen uh, in our in our system. I hope it doesn't, but uh, um, we face pretty um, serious opponents out there. Right. Number two is, I think we need to be able to innovate responsibly. There needs to be some sort of sandbox where you can try things and not, you know, run the risk of running afoul of regulation. 
because there are so many cool things that we could do that are very different today in terms of using data and information to increase lending, to, to think about financial uh, health and inclusion in, in different ways. But, you know, you want to be careful you don't run afoul of regulation, but there needs to be some sort of sandbox uh, to go and do that. And so I think, right. um, as I think about, you know, we're, we're moving into a new world. I believe that. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow whatsoever. I'm, I'm a pragmatic uh, person uh, around this. Um, but we are moving into a new world. That's going to happen, and new worlds demand new ways of thinking about our regulatory right. environment as well. Right. John, I know it's something that's <coughs> close to your heart, the issue mm -hmm. of regulation and data. Well, I'd just like to go on the record saying I like regulators very much. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, are there any regulators in the audience? <laughs> just in case. Take notes. One. There's one regulator, and one who wants to admit to it. And sometimes we refer to regulators, uh, and what we really mean is policymakers. And regulators' jobs really are to uh, ensure they supervise in, a, in normally a constructive way, and they enforce policy um, and rules. But the, but the rules are set by generally other people. Um, with feedback from the industry, but also from regulators. Um, and I think some people, my observation is that much of the debate in finance that's focused on regulation has focused on quite a numeric aspect of regulation. We've looked at prudential regulation, looked at adequacy of capital and liquidity. And there's been a lot of debate about that. And banks have generally gone from being undercapitalized 10 years ago to being now relatively safe. And there's still a lot of tinkering going on um, because the rules have become complicated. And when rules become complicated, they get arbitraged by people who are cleverer than the people who set the rules in the first place, or think they are. And that's been the case since regulation was invented. The much more complex regulation is almost a stealth regulation. And that's when, for example, banks, but other um, institutions within the finance world are asked to take on roles that are societal roles, they're utility roles. And one, and this is not specifically a Deutsche Bank point, but I think we've been slow to recognize that we are an extension of law enforcement. And the obligation goes beyond clients because it reaches potential clients. Mm. And our obligations, for example, to report to crime agencies, suspicious activity, where the the demand on the determination of what con constitutes suspicious activity is, is very, very onerous and is not single transaction related or single client related. It's pattern related, so having to develop pattern recognition systems to help ourselves. Where conduct of sale for financial institutions um, sets, sets hurdles that are much higher than for many other industries. And many other industries are presumed to be effectively competitive, and financial services presumed not to be. So if you want to sell a kilo of sugar at an egregiously high price as part of your business model, you probably won't sell very much, and so the market will put you out of business, and that's fine. If you want to sell an insurance product for a better margin than the market, you can actually be prosecuted for not treating customers fairly. Right. And a lot of that goes to um, management of data. And that's my point about um, hardware these days. If you buy some new hardware, you normally save costs, because the old hardware just costs you more to run, even in electricity terms. Software doesn't cost that much these days to develop. And you can partner with people who can do it very effectively. Cleaning data, managing data, organizing data, storing data, maintaining data, reporting on data is incredibly complex. And those are the standards to which I feel we are the highest we are held. And we've, we've not got a good legacy. Right. We haven't done well. We've had fragmented systems. We've never had standardized data, even where we've had standardized processes. And our inheritance as an indus industry is pretty lousy. Right. Now, if you talk to Tom, he'll say, well, wait a minute. I've got, I've got presumably, I've got pension policies that were written in the 1940s or 50s, potentially, still in force. Yeah. You know, the world has changed 100 times since then. How am I meant to manage that sort of information? And we're in the odd position of having to go back to people who have been clients for 20, 30 years, saying, can you now prove to us you are who you say you are? And they say, well, surely by now you know. And of course we do, but we're, that's, we're held right. to a different standard. Right. And I'm finding, personally, 
that we're thinking too much about data. Mm -hmm. We should have thought more about it. And we need to get smarter. And I think that's where we need to get really smart on new technologies. Well, that's a fascinating point. Um, I'm conscious I want to try and bring the audience in for questions in a few moments, but I quickly want to ask, James or Christine, do you have any strong views to add to this about... Yes, yes I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do I, I'll give you a chance thank to think, you, Thank you, John. Um, I'd, I'd like to make three points. One is um, the point made by Dan about having a sandbox where you can experiment, where you can test without uh, running too high risks, I think is a really interesting proposition. And I think it's, it's important to keep it as a sandbox and not to make it the courtyard where everybody is actually uh, playing. Because essentially what you're doing, I mean, all of, all of you, many of us, is, is actually dealing with public good. And when you deal with public good, when you deal with trust, to do it in a sandbox to make sure that you limit the damage that you do when you experiment, I think exactly. Is, is exactly the right thing to do. And part of the regulations that we've put in place since 2008 has been about precisely uh, protecting the public good and making sure that taxpayers' money is actually not on the line when too many mistakes have been made or when the tools that have been experimented in the sandbox have been elevated to a, to a higher um, level. So that's point number one. Point number two, I was, I was actually a little bit challenged by the point that I think you made, uh, John, which uh, when you said that regulations in the, uh, in the banking and finance business is actually decided by policymakers, as if sort of governments were in charge or parliaments were in charge. And I have my slight doubt about it, because when, I, when you are inside the system and when you see how regulations get negotiated, yes, governments participate, but most of the hard work, which eventually defines the uh, capital adequacy ratios, the liquidity ratios, the leverage ratio, TILAC, uh, as, as debated as it was, it's very much in the Basel Committee. It's very much in the, uh, in the FSB. Uh, that all of that is worked out and eventually channeled into the regulatory system as, as, as defined by virtue of it being decided by parliament. So I would say for bad or for good, and, and I'm not taking a view here because there is a lot of good about it, but the profession itself has a lot to do with how supervision is defined and how regulations are determined. And there is a lot of negotiations to be had in that respect. I mean, we saw, we have seen it since mm -hmm. uh, 2008. I would add that on the accounting front, it has been very much delegated to professionals. And when you look at the international accounting standards, many of them are actually decided by the profession itself, rightly or wrongly. But I, I would I would contend that parliaments and and you know sovereign representatives are part of the process, but they're a small part of the process rel relative to other industries. Final point that I would like to make. I was fascinated by what you said about data and the abundance of data, and the fact that cleaning up of data and management of data is going to be the thing of the future and critically important. And I was wondering, and that's a question, Gillian, if I may ask, whether the whole issue of de-risking, which is big for some countries around the world, and many more than we think, which consists, for those who are not uh, you know, in, the, in, in, in the know on that, which consists of some banks deciding to cut off links and ties with correspondent banks in those countries that are not capable to provide the data, know your clients, know your clients' clients, that is expected from some authorities, particularly in the US, whether that de-risking, which is bad news really for some countries, uh, which otherwise can operate legitimate businesses and legitimate households banking, whether that abundance of data and the improvement of managing those data can actually help limit this de-risking or avoid it altogether. Do you want to answer that briefly and then yes. I'm going to ask James? Or you can chuck, chuck it to well, James well, if you want. The answer is I think the answer today is no. No. Yeah. Because the issue with correspondent banking, um, and we just, we just um, stopped onboarding clients in... Uh, 109 countries, which we agreed with our regulators were highest risk countries. And the, the ask in correspondent banking is to know your correspondent bank's clients. And data protection rules prevent you from knowing your correspondent bank's clients. So the question is, which law do you want to break? And instead of breaking either, we exit correspondent banking. Yeah. And all that leads to is marginalization and social exclusion for the 109, in our case, riskiest and therefore least developed countries in the world. Wow, that's a sobering point. James? There's a lot of ground to cover there, Chile. <laughs> um, okay, you have two minutes, then we'll bring the audience in. <laughs> or you can take a pause, I'll ask the audience first. No, I'll, I'll give you two minutes worth. Um, 
two topics. One is regulation, one is ROE. On regulation, uh, the regulators will and should uh, get involved in the shadow banking sector, which is obviously they're involved in the core regulated banking sector already in the shadow banking sector uh, to the extent that there are cyber issues, because I agree with the point that is the big enchilada, to the extent that there are systemic issues created through concentration of risk and risk of contagion, uh, and to the extent that there are issues that affect consumer confidence, because at the heart of the banking system is trust. And, you know, it's the Jimmy Stewart movie about It's a Wonderful Life. When trust goes, people want their money back. Banks don't have their money. They've given it to somebody else. And that is sitting in somebody else's house. And that's actually what started the financial crisis, was a lack of trust when individuals and corporations saw banks taking credit hits. As a result, they pulled their money out thinking those hits would wipe out the equity. When they pulled their money out, it created a liquidity run. And with a liquidity run, eventually everybody dies, unless the all-time great steps in, which is the governments, and bail it out, which is what happened. So on the sort of whole fintech shadow system, regulators can and should get involved where it's cyber, where it's um, systemic on credit, risk of contagion, and where there's consumer, real consumer issues. I think just broadly, two quick broad comments. One, we can't talk about banks or financial institutions. Your correspondent banking is a project finance. Is it consumer lending? Is it student card lending? Is it credit card lending? Is it use of debit cards? Is it wealth management? Is it trust services? There are too many things going on under this. So we'd need many hours to do that, but that's, that's for another day. The important issue is the core banking industry pre-crisis had an ROE of about 25%. Mm. And that was because it was running balance sheets on capital with a ratio of about 40 times. As a result of regulatory action, sensibly, the banking industry has a capital uh, ratio of about 11 times and an ROE, unfortunately, of less than 10%. So in terms of sort of scale of change, you've taken a, one of the most important industries in the world and taken the ROE from 25% to call it 5%. FinTech and these changes that are happening in and around that, they're not rounding errors, but they're not transformative at that scale yet. Yeah. Within certain products, certain parts of payment system, peer-to-peer -peer lending, they're becoming much more than that. But it's system-wide, regulation remains the number one game, at least the here and now. Right, right. Well, thank you. That's a very, very good point indeed. Um, I'd like to bring the audience in for questions. Um, we've only got about 10 minutes. There are a lot of you, I can see a lot of you have strong feelings um, about these issues. Um, I should say I was in a session earlier discussing fintech and there was a very strong division in, pe pe in people's views about whether they thought it was good or bad. Um, but I think there are some microphones. Um, please keep your comments or questions extremely short or I will cut you off. Um, <laughs> And it would be courteous, but not compulsory, to identify yourself. So who would like to ask a question? OK, I can see Mr. Blockchain at the front. <laughs> George Pachashvili, Georgian Co-Investment Fund. So basically, your bread and butter is uh, storing uh, other people's money, making transactions with other people's money, do the, doing the same for the stocks, right, and issuing credit. All of that is done much more efficiently by blockchain even today in a decentralized way. Why are you so uh, ignorant, I may uh, say so, because uh, it's a big train coming right towards uh, your direction and uh, I don't see much concerns from your side. I'm very glad that Ms. Lagarde is uh, much more uh, positive <coughs> about the blockchain. <laughs> so, James and John, are you the rabbits in the headlines of the train coming down the track? <clears throat> I don't think so. <laughs> 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 not, not, not in the next um, four or five years. I can't see, um, I can't see it, blockchain being adopted that rapidly. Um, well, at the moment, we're regulated to take um, a, a dematerialized form of cash. That's what we do. So we borrow money from people <coughs> A at one rate. We lend it to people group B at a higher rate and try not to lose it. And... Um, <laughs> And we can be attacked. For, uh, you could argue that deposits, the deposit product, is no longer relevant in today's society. And James's business is geared around much more around not spe specifically wanting to take so much deposits. He's got a much more developed wealth management business. 
And he th his client base presumably is better served by offering a broader range of potential investment opportunities than a simple deposit rate of return. Banks have been regulated to take deposits, and a good use of those deposits was to lend them to other people for a positive margin. And that's traditionally how banking is built up. It's no compulsory reason, but banks had a competitive advantage conferred on them because they also dealt in people's money. And when you deal in people's money, you generally have a direct indicator of the health and therefore creditworthiness of the person to whom you're lending money. And so if you can bank, i.e. manage the cash flow of your creditor, sorry, of your debt, of your debt, then you can manage that arguably over a cycle better than someone who's blind to the cash flow performance of a borrower. And lots of income, I'm old enough and pr probably cynical enough, and yeah. you can, you can okay. suggest that I'm complacent enough, to know that there have been various cycles of disruptors in credit who've come along, mm -hmm. and they've grown incredibly quickly, and they've worried banks. I'm old enough to remember the, the, the centralized mortgage lenders in the UK. I'm a Brit. In the late right. 1980s, early 1990s, they took market share from building societies by lending to people uh, who either, in the end, couldn't pay back, uh, didn't have a house of the value that was sufficient to cover the debt, or didn't want to pay back. Right. And um, th they did disrupt for a while. But on the credit side, I wouldn't be complacent, but I would not be w so worried about crowdfunding, for example, right. where the ultimate aim is to lend to people where the lending, banks, I think, just have a competitive advantage because they have insight into cash flows. Okay, so banks have a competitive advantage. James, do you yeah, agree? I don't think anybody on the panel said that blockchain was not relevant, and I don't think anybody suggested that it's not something that we're looking at. In fact, it is. So uh, I would take your characterization of ignorance and turn it around as pragmatism. If you look at how we actually make money, Right. You have to look at what the blockchain technology would do, would do to disrupt that source of revenue. Is blockchain going to stop us from bringing Alibaba to market? So you have to look at how we make money before you make the assertion that our business is in a state of uh, inexorable demise. There are parts of the financial sector and the payment system and the storage of data and the use of that data which are clearly affected by it, but there are large parts that are not. They're affected actually by other forms of financial technology. Dan, as the disruptor on the panel, um, do you think blockchain is overhyped? <laughs> uh, well, we just brought on a board member who is one of the experts in cryptocurrency um, in the world. So we're obviously thinking about it quite a bit. Um, I think people have rightly disaggregated you know, Bitcoin, the currency versus the underlying technology. Part of the promise of the underlying technology is a reduction in transaction costs, um, which Christine rightfully mentioned, you know, helps with perhaps financial inclusion, et cetera. The problem is you have a currency that's bouncing around so much that you have to immediately translate it into fiat currency, and there's a 1% fee to go do that, so you take away some of that uh, efficiency right now because of the volatility of the currency associated with it. I do think that it's very possible um, that the rails in which we move money evolve into more of internet-based sort of rails as opposed to proprietary rails that are run now by some of the networks. Um, but. Um, but I, I feel, and I, this is going to be weird for a, a disruptor, but I, I feel the same way. I think there's a lot to think about yet with cryptocurrencies, not the least of which is what, what is the regulatory uh, final say going to be on that? You have multiple governments with multiple different views on it uh, right now. Um, but, you know, we allow Bitcoin into into PayPal as a payment mechanism right now through Coinbase um, because there are some people who want to do that. Um, but there's, well, no, I'm not gonna repeat the host of issues uh, with okay. it, but it's, uh, it's very interesting. Well, sadly, very sadly, um, I mean, we could talk about this for another couple of hours, I think. Um, we are pretty much out of time. I do apologize. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. I mean, I've taken away several key points. You know, one is that 
clearly there are some extraordinary changes going on right now which probably haven't had the attention they deserve until recently because the media investing public have, um, and the public have been focused so much on the financial crisis. Um, secondly, there's clearly an urgent need for regulators to think about this, um, policy makers too, and so certainly papers like the IMS paper are going to help spur that debate. Um, and thirdly, to me, it's still very unclear about who's actually going to be the winner here or not. I mean, clearly, the um, incumbents are still dealing with a legacy of regulation and distracted by that, and yet they do still have a pretty incumbent position in many areas. So it's going to be a very interesting fight going on. The one thing I am pretty clear about is that whatever banknotes you've got in your wallet right now, frame them, because eventually they'll be an investor's <laughs> item, collectible item. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.